this hammock camping. It is cold. Now there's a winter storm advisory and uh, they're saying we could get 8 to 12 inches tomorrow and low visibility, particularly up on the summits. So we're just going to play it by ear into the woods. I may have to make a second judgment call here. Hey everybody, Syntex77 here. Let me tell you what the current situation is. I am sitting here in the Jeep, trying to stay warm for my last little bit, my last moments, if you will, of warmness, because I'm about to go out on a winter trip. I'm up here in New Hampshire. We're in the White Mountains. Uh, a little more specifically, we're in the Sandwich Mountain Range area or the Sandwich Wilderness. And I'm gonna do three days, two nights of some winter camping. Out here, it's about 15 degrees. It is the beginning of February. Looks like we got plenty of snow on the ground around here. I got my map in front of me. Just going over my potential route one more time. And I'd say the theme, if you will, of this trip is going to be variability, for lack of a better term. I've got a sleep system that is pretty variable in that I'm going to be attempting to sleep in a hammock one night and on the ground in another night, both with the same insulation system. We'll get into that a little later, but I have a, usually I use an under quilt and top quilt system. This time I have more of a mummy pod system and that is going to completely surround me and envelop me with warmth, hopefully on my trip when I'm in hammock camping mode. And then I'm gonna switch it into more of a traditional sleeping bag mode on the second night, or perhaps it'll be the first night. I don't know, we're kinda gonna go with the flow here. But I can put it into that sleeping bag mode, shove it in a bivy sack. I do have a tarp with me, of course, and we'll just play it by ear. We'll have the ability to either camp between trees, hammock style, or on the ground, bivy style. In addition to that, in terms of variable systems, I got a brand new stove I'm testing. I have the Optimus Polaris OptiFuel. And that uses all kinds of different fuel. I have a separate video where I kind of talked about that and alluded to that, but I'll be testing that out. And I brought three different fuels with me. Now that is not something you'd actually probably do in real life, but I'm doing it for testing just to kind of show things off. So we're gonna try that out. It's kind of unique in that usually with those stove systems that are multi-fuel, you have to use different little nozzles for each fuel type. This one, I don't have to change anything. So I have three different fuels and I can just screw them on and use them however I like, or at least that's the way it goes, hopefully. And then on top of that, we're just gonna enjoy ourselves out here on a nice little solo trip. Well, you and I, but other than that, nobody else in the vehicle with me out in the woods here. So get my map folded up, got my pack back there. You can see a little bit in frame, my big old winter pack, my EMS Long Trail 70. I got snowshoes. I don't have crampons, but I do have some light traction in the form of micro spikes. What we're on right now, as I can see on my map here, Olivarian, I'm gonna say, Brook Trail. And that's gonna leave from the Kankamangas Highway here, Route 112. And at first it appears to be a ski trail, so it should be pretty nice and well-groomed. And it'll follow along the brook there. I'm gonna camp somewhere in here. I'm gonna aim for doing two different campsites for each night, but I think I'm gonna kind of base camp in a way in that I might hit one of these summits from camp not bring all my gear with me. It's now an interesting thing. We got a little bit of light snow today. The forecast was just some snow showers. I woke up this morning in a motel not too far from here and checked the weather and now there's a winter storm advisory and uh, they're saying we could get eight to 12 inches tomorrow and low visibility, particularly up on the summits. So we're just gonna play it by ear. If it's too bad, hey, we'll just stick to the woods. If it's ideal, then we'll go up and see what's up on the summits. But all in all, as long as I'm out in the woods testing some gear in the snow, it's going to be a win for me. So right now I'm going to pack up my uh, stuff here, put on my hard shell pants and my gaiters, and lock the Jeep up and hit the trail. All right, first little stretch here. As of right now, it's pretty hard packed right here. You can see some skis. I just saw a skier come back as I was pulling in. Now, like I said, it's pretty hard packed, so I don't feel bad. I'm not post holding. I'm not tearing up the ski trail. If it gets a little soft, less consolidated, I'll throw on the snowshoes, but right now it's feeling pretty good, although I am a little nervous to step off 
to either side of the trail here. I have a feeling I might go <laughs> up to, uh, oh, at least my knee or so. Oh, I'm not sure how deep it is. Guess we'll find out later, but for now, we'll take advantage of not having to put the snowshoes on, give our feet a rest. <sighs> I know we'll at least need them when we're at camp. I'm thinking probably a couple miles in, 1.9 or something like that to get to this junction, first junction, and then we'll make a decision. But I think we're gonna take the, um, there's a cut through trail that goes up towards Passaconaway Mountain. And we'll probably camp somewhere around there because after, after that little area along the brook, and when you start hitting the cutaway trail or cut through, whatever you wanna call it, it, uh, you can tell from the top how it starts getting pretty steep and aggressive. And I know from experience here in the Whites when you see top of lines like that, you're not going to find much in the way of camping. Now it is winter right now, so that's a good advantage for us. Because a lot of the normally very aggressive features on the ground, stumps and just crazy terrain, are covered up and smoothed over with snow. So that's going to help us a lot with our ground camping when we do that, as well as hammock camping, because even though the hammock goes in the air, and it's suspended between the trees, and you're not laying on the ground, it's still nice to have a more level campsite for walking around, getting to and from your hammock. There's been times where we've set up hammocks in the whites, and it's great. We would have otherwise not been able to camp there at all, but it's still a little bit of a pain, a little crazy, you know, to try to navigate around all kinds of aggressive terrain. So. That is a nice thing about winter. Get that smoothed over ground. Yeah, it looks like we're coming to a little info booth. So we'll check that out. And in fact, a little sign right there tells me where I'm going. I don't think I'm gonna venture over there because like I said, I don't know how deep that snow is. But pass a Conaway cutoff trail this way, 1.9 miles, all right, great. Square ledge and Paugus Pass. Paugus is another one of the peaks around here. All right, let's keep it moving. And another sign and split. Okay, cross country ski trail. This way and this way, so it must be a, a loop of sorts. Oliverian Brook Trail, this way. Snow has slowed down a little bit. Nice and quiet. Calm. Not bad. Olivian. I can't. I can't. Maybe by the end of the trip, I'll, I'll actually pronounce this. Olivarian. The Olive Brook Trail is what I'm going to call it. <laughs> Looks like Ski Trail diverts to the right. We're going to keep on the less traveled path here into the woods. Now I don't plan on doing many miles today, as the astute amongst you may have already <laughs> figured out, considering that I said I'm going to camp around the junction and the junction's about 1.9 miles in. I just want to relax, have a good time, and then there's also this factor with the weather. Sounds like it's potential for some pretty heavy snow. Although things can change on a dime around here, so who knows? Maybe there's gonna be no snow tomorrow, but from looking at the Mount Washington weather website, which is pretty much the go-to, some of the best meteorologists in the world are up there. From reading what they wrote up today, it looks, looks like a pretty sure thing that we're gonna get something. So I'll set myself a little base camp up, and then we'll take it from there. telltale sign of somebody else with snowshoes. Several other people with snowshoes actually because this is packed out pretty good still. Still no need for me to put on mine which is nice. Over here is the brook. I, can, I was steadily hearing that get louder and louder and now I'm pretty much just following right along next to it. Just making my way on now. I'm kind of taking my time. Holding back from going too fast. Don't want to overheat too much especially because not only do I have these army 
surplus uh, overcovers. They don't breathe at all, but they're waterproof. They're like nylon. I have those over top of my fleece line hiking pants. And in addition to that, I also have these gaiters. So my legs are quite warm. I got the zippers open, the pit zips, to try to keep me ventilated up top. I can unzip a little bit if I need to. But yeah, I'm just going kind of slow. I do like having these on though, it's pretty much head to toe. If I do take a tumble or have to go to my knee to do something, I'm not gonna get wet. I'm gonna stay dry as long as I don't overwork and start sweating underneath here. Ah. And there we go, officially entering the sandwich range. So, shouldn't be too much further for our junction. Limit group size 10 people, no problem there. Unless you're watching this with a bunch of your friends, but don't worry, we won't tell anybody. Uh, no use of motorized equipment, no problem. Always practice, leave no trace, and camp at established hardened sites at least 200 feet from the trails. <sighs> All right, that's what we're gonna do. Keep it moving. <sighs> All right, this is finally the junction I've been after. So somewhere around here, I'm gonna start looking for camp. I'm looking at my topo map on oh, my trusty GPS. I can tell there is some flatter stuff up in here somewhere. So I'm gonna poke around up there and try to find somewhere to set up camp. Also, according to my GPS, we're already down to three and a half hours of daylight. Uh, I didn't get the quickest start today. I did realize that I left my maps at home, so I had to find somewhere that sold maps because I really wanted a map for this trip, a nice real paper map. Even though my wife did send me pictures on her cell phone, I just wanted a paper map. Um, also because I didn't know exactly what I was doing as of this morning route-wise. So I was still kind of on the edge planning at the hotel last night and whatnot. Anyway, so a little bit later start than I wanted, but above all, it's really just these days are so short in the winter. So I'm going to get to it because like I said, I want it to be pretty relaxed today and then tomorrow maybe we'll see what happens with this snowstorm. <sighs> Two nights, three days. Not bad. So let's get up in here, right over here, and see if we can't find somewhere to set up. It's probably time for me to put these snowshoes on too because um, I don't think I want to go in that with these boots because this right here is the monorail which means basically that the snow has been beaten down by snowshoers and bear booters like myself. And it's super compact right now. I'm not post-holing at all, but step to the left or right where people haven't been walking for a couple months now on the snow that's been accumulating. And bloop, we're most likely gonna go in, depending on the depth of the snow, anywhere from three to six feet. So snowshoe time. It's good to get that off. Probably have a drink of water too. Oh, I got my trusty MSR Denali Ascents snowshoes. Had these a while now. I bought them used on eBay. They haven't made them in years. Nowadays, I guess the modern equivalent would be uh, like the MSR Evo or I'm not sure. These are a little heavier than the ones nowadays, but I also got them uh, relatively less money. So I'll pop these guys on. Make sure that I have them set up correctly. I didn't bring the floats. I do have flotation pieces that go on the back. I, I've never, I've brought them before, but I found I never used them in the whites, at least not yet. So for my weight and the type of snow that I'm on, 
Um, I've never found a need for more than the uh, the standard configuration here, but there isn't a black piece that would extend these another, I don't know, six or eight inches. But these seem to be fine. So I'll pop these guys on. You can see they have the more aggressive teeth on there, which may or may not come in handy uh, depending on what we do tomorrow. But compared to like a normal snowshoe that you would use on flat ground, just somewhere like a little, little more relaxed, um, these are going to be much better. I used to have a pair like that, but we're going uphill. A, you have a lot more traction on this. There's just no way around that. And then also they just fit a lot better and they have this little piece on the back that pops up. And once that goes up, your boot rests against it. And when you're going up a steep pitch, steep grade, um, this way your foot doesn't have to come all the way back down to the angle of the snow or the trail you're on it can actually rest there. It really reduces fatigue a lot because you're not swinging your ankles all the way up and down or your feet all the way up and down like that. It makes a bigger difference than you'd think. But for walking on flat ground like we're about to do or relatively flat ground, back and forth between flat and slopes, we're gonna leave that off. And they go on pretty quick. And you can see that I'm getting them on pretty easily despite the fact that I'm wearing gloves because they have these rubber pull kind of mechanisms. You just pull it until you get the tightness you want and it'll lock in on that little clasp type thing set up there. Get these adjusted, the pack back on my back, and we'll start scouting for the campsite. Hmm. It's flat, but it's also incredibly dense with smaller growth, saplings and whatnot. Something that you can't see on a topo map. You just gotta take your chances sometimes. But yeah, this is looking a little tough. We're gonna figure something out though. All right, a little further back down the trail, cut in. It's got a little more promise. I mean, I don't know that this is it, but it's definitely more open than it was over there. So I think maybe a little further back here, looks like it might be good and it levels out. Basically went uphill a bit. <laughs> Oop, gotta get used to wearing these snowshoes, almost went down. Um, uh, went uphill a bit down from there, which is where the trail uh, is, was, as we depart it and head this way. All right, well, next thing you know, it's three o'clock after trouncing around in here and being all indecisive about where I wanted to be. But I think I found a nice spot. Now, whether or not we stay in this exact same spot, both nights, I'm not sure yet. If I was just doing a quote unquote normal hammock camping trip with one system to test, I think I would definitely just base camp here and maybe go do the summit tomorrow, play around come right back and do the same exact spot again. But because we're doing the hammock one night and the ground sleeping the other night, I don't know if we'll move far from here or if we're just gonna test both here, I'm not sure yet. As of right now, I have the hammock set up. Now, I did show this in my abandoned Air Force base and I know that it did work. I got through the night, but I tried to make some improvements, but now I'm wondering if they were smart or not. So let me show you what I got going on. This here, suspended from the two trees, of course, is my setup with the Outdoor Vitals Mummy Pod system. Now, this is also a sleeping bag, and you can kind of tell as it hangs there that it does look like it's a sleeping bag, only I got my hammock coming out both ends. Now, a crucial part of hammock camping, for most people's comfort at least, and for safe stress loads and whatnot, is to do a 20 degree hang, and then you diagonally lay in there, which is why some people get a little skittish when they see this system, because it is true, when you look at it, you wonder, can you get diagonal in there still? Well, when I did it, I found that I still could get a bit diagonal in there, but I did find, when I tested it, I did it with the Outdoor Vitals hammock, and it was a 10-footer. I went ahead this time, because my shoulders felt a little constricted, I went ahead this time and did a Dutchware Nylon D 11-footer, 
put it through there. Now I know it's still confined to the same space, but I just want to see, I just want to test and find out if I can get a little more comfort. Cause I did find I could get a little bit of a diagonal lay, which I usually don't do an extreme diagonal anyway. Uh, but I did get that last time, but I just felt like I was being squeezed a little bit. Now it may not matter that this is 11 foot because I'm you know, stuck inside that bag right there, but we'll find out. Another thing I did, I was trying to, I thought it was slick. You see, I have a ridge line this time. Now the actual system that comes from Outdoor Vitals does not have a ridge line. And I believe the reason they did that, well, I thought the reason they did that at first was just because you got to slide this thing on and a permanent ridge line would make that just about impossible, right? Because then the ridge line would be running through your bag as well. So what I did was I took this here line, instead of being connected directly to the continuous loop there, I have a Dutch ridge line carabiner. And that way I could unclip this once I was set up, put the bag through and then reclip it. Now, after putting all that effort into it, it's kind of ironic because this here hammock is on titanium cinch buckles and I had that all set up and then I realized I got to unthread this to get it through. So I would be better off with a quick disconnect system like uh, Dutch beetle buckles where I actually have a little hook that goes right onto the line so it's just quicker to get on and off. Or the way Outdoor Vitals does it with their hammock and it makes sense is kind of like a hook system for whoopies and you can get that off quicker. So in the future I would switch this to a system where I can directly disconnect from these continuous loops just to make my life a little easier. But what I'm noticing now besides the fact that I think I need to raise that end a little bit but we can do that later. I might be fighting the system by putting the ridge line on there. The ridge line is forcing it to be a nice 30 degree hang angle but unfortunately you may actually need to kind of abandon that rule for this system and go flatter which usually like I said you don't want to do but for this system you might want to actually do that and pull your uh, suspension tighter than you normally would. Now there's reasons not to do that besides comfort you can put a little too much stress on there so you got to be careful. I don't know this is a work in progress people. I am uh, just going through the motions here trying this system out. Like I said, I used it before in exactly the way they intended and it was good, but I felt like I could be a little more comfortable, but I did get through the night and an advantage of this system is that you can use it for the ground just as well. Although I should point out hammock gear quilts, which is what I usually use, can be used on the ground and have. I took my zero degree hammock gear burrow quilt, which usually is my top quilt in the hammock. I took that down to 20, uh, 25, yeah, 25 below zero well beyond its intended rating on the ground. I just used some shock cord to kind of uh, lace up the back of it to keep it tighter and I did get through it. That being said, it's not for everybody to use a quilt as a uh, sleeping bag. I wore a hat because there's no hood and you do have to worry about rolling around and exposing your back. So for somebody looking to not spend money on two systems, in fact this right here is under I believe $150 or so just for the bag. So you could give yourself the capability what I'm seeing right now is, for me personally at least, it might not be perfect for both, but at least it's capable of both. But we'll find out. As a sleeping bag, I'm sure it's just fine. Um, I'm just working out the quirks with how it works on the hammock here. But we'll see. Um, I'll try it tonight and we'll see how it goes. In the meantime, I'm getting hungry. I was supposed to have a hot lunch because I want to test all these different stove configurations out. Uh, I brought a lot of food to cook. So I'm going to have some noodles for lunch, but at this point it's actually like 3 o'clock, so it's going to be a late lunch, but that's okay. And yes, I did say noodles. Uh, I know I've been doing keto, or a ketogenic diet, which is high fat, low carb. 90% of the time I've been on that for going on a year now. Um, but there are times that I come off for three days to a week at a time, just depending on stuff that's going on, vacations or whatnot. We just had the Super Bowl and this trip coming up, so I went off for of keto. And I'm going to stay off until the end of this trip so I can get a burger, a real cheeseburger, on a bun somewhere in New Hampshire after this trip is done. And in the meantime, I'm going to use the stove to cook some fun stuff like noodles, some, uh, I got some Alpine Air backpacking dinners, some old school mountain house backpacking dinners, which are some favorites of mine. So I'm just going to cook a bunch of carby food that I usually don't get to eat. And I'm going to do that right now with the new stove. It's right here in this bag. You see my tie back there for organizing. Got my pack over there. Uh, this is it. It's in there at least. My Optimus Polaris multi fuel stove. And my cook kit. Now, since I'm doing noodles and melting snow, I like a nice wide 
pan, I usually bring a little Tokes 750 mil pot that's kind of tall and narrow. This guy here is more of a, oh, I got some paper towels there. Oh, let's see if you can see this. Uh, there's another little cup. I did bring a Tokes cup for coffee in the morning. It's a fire kit in there with some matches and some other towels. Back up lighter. Get the bag off of there. Uh, there it is. So this is a one liter pot, which means I can comfortably get it to 750 milliliters in there, no problem. I can melt snow in this, it's a little wider base, so I can just dump handfuls in there a little easier when it comes to melting snow. And I find this pot just a little nicer for cooking noodles directly in it and whatnot. Flip out handles, of course it's about double the weight I would say, but that's okay, sometimes you make those sacrifices. Especially on a trip like this where I'm probably going to be leaving this stuff behind at camp if I do anything too strenuous. So there's my noodle pot. All right, so now I have a little alcove cut out here. A little spot for my stove. No wind right now, which is great, and none really in the forecast, which for the White Mountains is crazy. So even though I have all that snow coming, I don't have high winds, so I'm doing pretty good on that. But anyway, if the winds do come around, this will help, and it's nice and stable. Now, as alluded to earlier, my stove that I'm carrying can do a whole lot of different fuels. So I brought three different types with me to test out today. Here's the actual stove itself, right there. And the legs will click out. Just heard some very strange animals in the distance, by the way. I thought it was some kids, or like maybe even young adults, having fun. Uh, screaming and yelling, but then I noticed it's like a howling sound, so I don't know if it's some coyotes, coyotes, however you want to say it, or whatever, but um, yeah, it was quite a racket a minute ago. Anyway, as long as they don't come over the visit, that's the stove right there, and I got some windscreens here, some other tools. I'll do a full review on this um, eventually, but we're testing it out today and going over some different fuels. So I have canister fuel. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. It's one of the more common things. And then I have a gas of, or a can of, bottle, pardon me, of white gas. And then I have some straight up. Now this is uh, not the most ideal fuel. In fact, in the actual manual from Optimus, uh, this is, um, I would say strongly discouraged, or they say used as a last resort. This is diesel fuel right from the gas station. Now, the nice thing about that is it is ubiquitous compared to these other fuels, easy to find, especially if you're out of the country or if you're on the way to Trailhead and you forgot fuel, uh, you can pick this up and it's super cheap. I filled this whole bottle for 40 cents and that was actually, I accidentally overfilled it by like two ounces. This is a 15 ounce max bottle. So it probably should have been 30 cents. Now, on the downside, we'll just start with diesel uh, and why it's not, too great it burns pretty dirty and it usually um, in my experience with testing so far and from what I've read uh, can give a bit of a, a yellow less clean kind of flame there is some soot left on my pots and stuff but like I said in a pinch it will work especially if you're somewhere where you can't get the other fuel so I wanted to come out and test kind of a worst case scenario fuel next up is white gas uh, white gas is great for lower temps uh, compared to the canister fuel here and it burns nice and clean, way cleaner than the diesel. Then we go on to the canister fuel, which is great. It's convenient. I'm sure we've all seen these stoves before, but they're not great for cold temps. Uh, below around 20 degrees, these things start to not work so well. It's a blend of propane and butane. I've gone into it in detail in my other video where I totally nerded out on stoves. If you want to see all that stuff, check it out. But the, the long and the short of it is it's a mix of butane and propane and in cold temps that propane wants to burn off faster or first. That's all well and good, but then you're left with just the butane and butane doesn't burn very well in the cold. So what you can do to combat that is flip it over into inversion mode, which this stove is capable of because it's remote. Normally you would not be able to do that, right? Because the um, burner's connected right to the top on a lot of models. So we'll test that out. But the white gas can go down even lower. So that is an advantage of this. Now let's talk real quick before I uh, start making my soup because I am hungry. There is a long list, like seven or eight different fuels that this thing can go through, including kerosene, jet fuel, um, actual automotive gasoline, but for the most part with these three fuels, I've pretty much hit the three categories that you can do with most backpacking stoves in general, because in general, for our purposes, backpacking, K2 
kerosene, diesel, and jet fuel are all essentially the same thing. They're just refined to different levels and they may have different additives or not have different additives. But most things that can run on one of those, it's interchangeable. It may not be optimal, but it's interchangeable. Then you got white gas and gasoline. Those two are kind of cousins and interchangeable. In fact, white gas is basically, from what I've read, just a 50 octane gasoline with no additional additives that would normally be put in there for like cars and stuff. That's why if you go to a gas station and get real automotive gasoline, that would be a last resort as well in a pinch because it's going to burn pretty dirty and that and diesel are gonna leave behind more soot, make you have to clean your stove more often. So you can buy this. Now this was $13 for a can of it, which may have been like a gallon. So that's kind of expensive, but if you're not backpacking that much, it's okay. So if I had these three fuels, but not a lot of them right now, I probably would opt to use this canister because it's only 27 degrees. So we're about seven degrees above um, where this thing would start failing. So it would probably be smart to use this right now if my fuel levels were critical. I'd use this right now while it's a little warmer and then maybe tonight or tomorrow morning I'd use the white gas which burns better. Um, but for fun, since we have daylight right now, we're just gonna go ahead and test out the white gas um, because it's something different and I've showed these canisters plenty. Maybe we'll save the diesel for um, tomorrow towards the end when we burn that dirty stuff, right? I'm just gonna connect it. You would not need this piece here if you were running the canister, but there it is. It's got the little pump in there and it pressurizes. Make sure he's off. Now, like I said, this is all one fuel nozzle for every fuel, which is why I'm able to pretty easily, even with gloves on, I could, if I wanted to, switch through all these fuels pretty quickly. I flip it, it says off on one side, on on the other. So I wanna put it so the on side is up, open up the fuel valve. And this is a full bottle, so I'm only gonna pump around 20 times. If it was half full, maybe pump 20 or 40 times or so. I'll also make sure that this is closed before I do this. Control valve in the back that I'll use to regulate the temperature. The valve over here is just to open it. All right, that's 20. If it starts to get too hard to pump, you've probably gone too far. If you get a yellow flame, it's probably overpressurized as well, especially with a cleaner fuel like this white gas. It should burn nice and blue. If you see, if you see yellow, it's probably overpressurized. And now, next step, I want to prime it. Right now, it's in liquid form. It's going to come out in liquid form. I want it to burn uh, in gas form, or at least kind of like aerosolized, I guess. Something like that. Um, so in order to do that, first we got to heat the tube up going to it. And then once it's heated up, I can let liquid fuel through. And before it gets to the burner, it'll get super heated up and turn into a gas. And now you're burning gas. But right now I'm just going to open for two seconds to prime it. One, 1,000, two, 1,000. You can actually see a little bit of fuel spurt out. And there's a wick in there. And then I got a regular lighter, so I'm going to try to just go through the side. The lighter's failing. All right, that's okay. That's why you also carry matches, right? You know what, let's just kick it old school. Come on. There it is. All right, that got it. Uh, now, hopefully that's not too much. No, it's looking good. So that'll um, burn down. And once it's just about almost burned down, that probably means after about two minutes that that tube uh, is heated up. And then I can go ahead and slowly open this up and we'll have flames. So. Always good to have a striker. All right, almost out. Slowly open. Come on. Might not be quite there because it's sputtering. I'm gonna let it do a little simmer, continue heating itself up. And you know, I just realized, and it's good for you guys so you can see, but I don't have my windscreen on there or my heat reflector on the bottom. I'm sure you shouldn't move the stove while it's <laughs> in use like that but here's some water that I have left I always like to start my snow melting with a little bit of water in the pot aids in the process and I'm not going to do a whole snow melting shift right now which I will have to do later I'm going to uh, just get enough going for for soup now this is still on a simmer it's nice and efficient I can crank it up more at around two full rotations of the control valve back here it's at max Opening it any more than that, uh, from what I read in the manual and what I've seen, doesn't actually increase the power any, but you are wasting fuel. So pop that on there. And I'm gonna use my actual lid 
scrape some of that top layer away. I'm just going to use some of this stuff right here as my initial snow. I don't need much snow, or pardon me, water for noodles. So this will be quick and easy. But it'll be nice to have a nice hot soup. And that broth will be tasty. Put the lid on. Let that sit for a couple minutes. And then I'm just going to throw my ramen in. And I'll be eating lunch, even though at this point, <laughs> it's like 4 o'clock after all my playing around at camp here. But that's all right. It'll be a late dinner, although I don't foresee myself staying up too late. Didn't get a ton of sleep last night. Drove here about nine hours last night, got to the hotel, did some planning, like I said, and got up nice and early so that I could go find a map. All right. I see steam. That lid is dancing. Dump my noodles in. I'm going to bring it up just back up to a boil. And then I'm going to flip this bottle over, which, like I said, should cut off any more fuel from the bottle and then burn off the remaining fuel in the line, which, depending on your fuel type and conditions, can mean that even though you've turned it off, it'll continue to burn for a little bit. That's okay. That's normal. And poof, just like that, it suddenly cuts off. I'm going to let that steep for a second. Then I'm going to sit down on my couch that I made over here. Since I do have some sleeping pads with me, two of them, for when I go to sleep on the ground tomorrow. But for now, it'll make a good couch so I can eat my noodles. <sighs> See what we're working with here. And it's hot. Ah, I'm like a hot meal in the middle of a snow-covered woods. And a nice little bench you just cut out of the snow. The shovel. Mm. That is awesome. Living it up. Have some nice broth to drink afterwards, and I'll start melting some snow. But that'll be later. Right now, I'm going to hang out, eat my noodles. Probably just chill out. I don't know that I'm going to even mess with making a fire. I just, um, I just might not bother. I might just hang out and relax. Probably put on my audiobook that I was listening to on the nine hour drive up here huh. which is pretty good so maybe i'll do that eat my noodles and then um we can reconvene later for another meal for dinner which i don't know i got a new one i've never tried before by alpine air that's like a thai dish but that's noodles as well and i'm having noodles now so i think i'll save that for tomorrow maybe i'll go old school mac and beef but anyway look at me i'm talking about the next meal while i'm eating this one all right anyway you know what I realized too, I feel kind of silly, but now I feel a little better about this setup, even though with the ridge line on there. Notice how that looks like a little less of a U shape. I totally forgot earlier to take these lines here at each end. It's like some shock cord through two loops, runs up to the end there, and at the head end, runs up to the end of the hammock as well. And that is keeping it from sliding back and forth and I can center it on the hammock and now it's where I want it to be and at night it's not going to go anywhere as far as back and forth on the line and it looks a lot more secure as well. Toggles there through the tab and with the pressure they don't come out. At first I was a little skeptical that those would pop off but honestly once a little weight's on there they're not coming off of that tab. It's fine and then I just run it up to the end by the continuous loop. It seems to work okay. And the length of the bag. This is a 15 degree model, by the way. They do have a zero degree, but I figure 15 should be fine tonight. The low, I think, is maybe single digits. Worst case scenario, I can put a hot water bottle in here with me as long as I put the lid on tight. Trail killer. And there's the toggles at the other end as well. So that's nice. I do feel a little more confident in that now. And then you can see I have my um, tarp set up behind me. I'm going to put that down. I just had it up so I could show everybody out there a little more clearly what's going on. But there are some snow flurries still coming down. And that snow, I don't know, I've seen it go back and forth. I don't have internet service anymore. That is long gone. But last I read, uh, they were varying on the times that it might begin. But it looks like all tomorrow, including possibly the morning, is when the heavy snow begins. So I'll be covering this guy up just to keep the quilt dry for now and to keep the wind off of me tonight which actually on the abandoned air force base video that i did with this i had some horrendous wind just pounded me all night way worse than i'll probably experience here and uh because of the way this system kind of completely envelops you 
I wasn't that cold. It actually blocked the wind and managed to stay warm at the same time. And that was with, uh, it was probably only in the 30s. So the wind was hurting me, but luckily I had a 15 degree bag, so it kind of balanced out. Tonight, I'm gonna to be pushing this bag past its rating from 15 down to potentially single digits. So I'm definitely gonna put the tarp down to take even more wind off of me. And then I don't have it here because I wanna kind of test this system in its actual normal configuration, although that's not really true. I've already modified the hammock setup, but I could put a sock on there, a Dutch wear winter sock that I really like. I just recently got a new one with a zipper on the side for easy entry. I could put that on there and put it down even further in rating, especially now that I've done the little modification and I put the ridge line on there, that would allow me to have the sock and then I'd be kind of inside a little cocoon um, as well. So that's a future, future experiment potentially to do. But right now I see a little snow sitting on the bag, so I'm gonna cover this thing up and then get to melting some snow. Well, just like that, and it is pitch black out here. Got the tarp set up. Honestly, it's not quite as low as I probably should have it, especially when I get in. I'm probably going to have some coverage, or I should say lack of coverage for wind, but I'm not too worried about it tonight. It's pretty good. Otherwise, I'd fiddle with it some more, try to get it lower on there uh, to block the wind. But looking pretty good. It's going on, eh, going on 5.30, and like I said, it is dark. Short days, short days. It's been dark for a little bit now, too. So... Got that set up and now it's just time to relax, have some dinner. Next thing you know, it'll be morning and we'll do some more adventuring. Quite a nice morning so far, although it is cold, very cold. Just starting to get that snow, it's beginning. We got a little more snow to melt before I head out and I'm gonna try to maybe tag this summit. But after cooking breakfast, I don't quite have a full bottle of water, so I'm gonna just melt a little more before I hit the trail here. Woke up this morning. And it has just been brutally cold. I don't know how cold because the watch I have with me, temperature only goes down to 15 degrees and then it doesn't give me a readout anymore and I haven't had a readout since about 6.30 last night. I uh, used up all my white gas, used the last of it this morning. I actually simmered for about two hours last night melting snow. Now, I didn't, I could have done it faster if I wanted to, but I was just kind of hanging out doing other chores. So I had it on a real low simmer, just kind of checking it here and there and doing pots of snow melt and it went from about six o'clock till eight o'clock plus I did that um, meal the noodles before and heated up my dinner on the white gas and then I melted a pot this morning and I finally conked out that bottle there's a little more fuel in the bottle but despite all my pumping it's just not enough in there to get um, a good flow going so that's about the extent of that bottle so I went ahead and hooked up a canister because I was planning on taking this on my hike with me to do a lunch out on the trail somewhere hoping that it warms up later. So I just wanted to test it out. It's super easy. Not only does it use the same fuel nozzle, but it uses the same threads as the pump bottle. So I just screw it right on there. Our goal is to light the propane first, get that heated up like a priming type thing, and then flip it over and start feeding the full mixture of butane and propane together through it. But uh, it lit for about 30 seconds and then conked out. It's just way too cold out here. Um, speaking of which, how did it go last night in the mummy pod, you might be wondering? Well, in all fairness, I pushed that thing way past its temp rating. I would say it was definitely in the single digits. The way it felt this morning, I think it might have been below zero, possibly, but definitely single digits. And uh, I was cold a few times, although the main problem seemed to be one time I woke up and the, the end of it had, where the, the foot end had unzipped quite a bit. So little did I know for like half an hour of being cold, that it was just cold air rushing in by my feet. I fixed that, I tried to tie it up the best I could, and then I woke up a couple more times with cold feet. I ended up taking my military fleece, which I'm wearing underneath here. I wrapped it around my feet 
and um, that got me through the rest of the night. Woke up this morning and found out it had opened up a little bit more again. So I have to kind of perfect. There's a bunch of loops down there and stuff, and maybe I'm not using the zipper right, but I have to perfect how to keep that zipper from opening. The other thing I should mention is I wasn't exactly using it as intended. You're supposed to pull yourself, you know, the mummy hood all the way around you and seal it up around your neck, and there's a nice baffle, and then you're completely sealed up. Well, I'm used to a sock system, so for whatever reason, I decided I wanted to kind of be in it, especially because I went to bed early and had nothing to do but listen to podcasts on my phone. So when you're in there completely zipped up, you don't have access to your hands. You can't really do anything but sleep. So I pulled myself in like a, sh like a turtle going into its shell, and that allowed me to mess with my phone and kind of be stuck in there. And then I also got some uh, trapped body heat from me breathing, the downside of which could be condensation, but I didn't have that problem. The problem I had was because I pulled myself in side like a turtle, there was that opening up top where my head should have been with my neck sealing off that baffle. And so I was getting cold air rushing in. That was another challenge, but that's not the system's fault. That's just me trying to use the system in a way it wasn't intended. I ended up taking this hat off and stuffing the hole closed and then I was good, if not for my foot situation, which I didn't discover till this morning. So it takes some uh, experimentation. Definitely, honestly, my go-to comfort system is the deep winter hammock set setup that I showed in um, this video that I linked where I use the Dutchwear sock and my hammock gear quilts. But that being said, if it comes to versatility, like we're gonna see tonight when I sleep on the ground, you know, there are trade-offs. So we'll see how it goes tonight and um, take it from there. Anyway, back to the gas. Yeah, I can't get this lit and I'm out of white gas. So I need to melt this snow here. So what are we gonna do? Well, I wasn't planning on using this until tomorrow just as an experiment, but I have an even bigger size bottle completely full of diesel, this larger bottle here. So we're gonna use diesel fuel right now and try to melt some snow. Diesel is a little harder to get uh, lit though. In liquid form, diesel doesn't really want to ignite. So it can be a little harder in that priming phase because remember, you gotta light the liquid when it's in the fuel cup. Nice and tight full bottle so I'm just going to pump like 25 times and we're going to try to see how this thing works compared to the white gas. Good, let a little fuel out. About two seconds and I can actually sit it, see it sitting in the fuel cup. It might actually be too much. I'm afraid, because diesel's harder to light, I might not be able to get it going with just a striker. Hopefully my lighter man, uh, works today. Oh, I heard it and then it went out. The diesel type fuels are actually a bit safer because they are harder to ignite. Sometimes guys will take, they'll carry a little denatured alcohol like you would use in an alcohol stove and they'll put that in the priming cup to get it started. I'm gonna just hope my lighter works today. Get these old matches that all the stuff rubbed off of the head. But hopefully, come on. All right, I can use this other lighter to light the match where the match had disintegrated off. And now I got my diesel fuel lit. So you can see it was not as easy as the white gas by far. It's also really cold. A tip would be to keep this in the sleeping bag with you, like in a plastic bag for safety probably. Keep it warm all night. So this is a worst case scenario test. It's somewhere in the single digits at least. And this thing's been sitting on the snow <laughs> since yesterday. But we got it lit. Uh, if you had like a butane lighter that put out like a jet that would probably make it easier to get the flame in there Now I got to keep an eye on this. I've heard of guys double priming these meaning that they have to actually prime it twice To get it hot enough at home in my testing. I didn't have to do that, but it is really cold right now So we'll see we'll just give this a minute and then I'll see if I can turn this jet on and melt the snow and we can get on the trail It did go out. I had to actually light another priming cup full of fuel quick tip too. remember how I said it doesn't want to light in liquid form if you just put a match up to a pool of wet diesel, it's going to go out. You want to light it from the bottom so it hits the wick that's in here, and then it lights up much easier. But at this point, it's been primed twice. I got a slow trickle of fuel. You can see how much dirtier this is in the yellow flame. Now, it's not, I don't think, still heated up, although I've never gotten a blue flame, even at home, testing this. But, uh, yeah, that's burning pretty dirty. That's diesel for you. It will get a little better as it heats up, at least I hope. <laughs> and um, it'll definitely leave some residue on your pot. But we will have melted water. That's the good thing. And we've got plenty of this fuel. Oh, all right. That's starting to be a little more 
like an actual flame. I can deal with that. I'm just going to keep it nice and low. There we go. Yeah. Oh, all right. So when I turn it up too much, I can't handle it. It probably starts getting like a mixture of liquid in there or something. I mean, at least it looks like a stove flame. It's just yellow instead of blue, but I'll take it. All right. I'll tell you what, though. It may not be the most glamorous of fuels, but it's got some power to it. It, it may very well be the most powerful fuel I've used with this stove so far, at least with this particular stove. Uh, it ripped right through this whole pot of snow. Matter of fact, it's almost about to get it to a boil. I'm going to pour this water in here without getting too many pine needles. Drink a little bit, fill it the rest of the way so I'm nice and hydrated. And then we'll finally hit the trail. I've got some snow coming down. Ooh. Tell you what. This snow is coming down pretty good. In fact, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to have my good camera out if it keeps accelerating like this, but I'm trying. Looks like it's about to start going uphill here. And it has dawned on me that because I played around at camp so much, well, half played around, half did things I really needed to do, right? I need water, I need to melt snow, I need to eat. I had some grits and coffee this morning and whatnot, did some chores, but I didn't end up leaving till 11 o'clock. What I'm doing is about a three mile hike. Doesn't sound too bad, but I started at camp at 1500 feet and I'm going up to around 4,000 ish. So that's a decent amount of gain in the snow with snowshoes. Uh, yeah, so I'm starting to realize <laughs> I may be hiking back down here in the dark if I end up taking my time because I did bring a hot lunch with me, my stove. I still have weight on my back too because of all those things, plus camera gear, etc. Um, yeah, so we'll see. Now, remember, tonight's scenario is that there's no hammock. And of course, we all know the hammock's actually there and it's set up and we're staying in the same spot, but we're going to take it down. Let's just pretend that I was in a situation where there is no ability to set up the hammock, no trees, whatever, or perhaps one of my straps broke. I could probably improvise that, but let's just say a strap broke or I didn't have straps. I showed up. Oh my God, I don't have straps. But luckily I have my sleeping pad, which actually is 14 ounces compared to camp stools, which are around a pound at least. I have one that's a pound, one that's a pound and a half in the winter. You can make a little couch like I did and put that pad down. So I usually carry that anyway. So long story short, tonight we're going to pretend that we have to sleep on the ground with the bivy and the sleeping bag. And I really am hoping to show you guys that. But if it's dark when I get back, well, we'll just have to catch up and I'll show you the details of it in the morning, you know, outside or whatever I see with the flashlight. I'm just thinking ahead. That's worst case scenario because I don't want to go too fast. I do want to enjoy myself. I also don't want to burn out. And I know from experience that these trails, well, I just know trails in the whites in general are pretty brutal. Some of the most aggressive in the country. And add in the snowshoe element and ice. And it can be downright demoralizing sometimes. Which is why I picked a short route and I'm just gonna stay positive and I got snow all over my camera. So I'm gonna keep on chalking along here. challenging around these parts. Definitely glad I brought hiking poles. These are some Seanock Outdoors carbon fiber guys. I do have a pair of black diamonds that I usually bring on these trips. I rarely use hiking poles, but in this case, uh, winter trips, I do, especially for snowshoes. And I'm sorry if the footage is a little weird now. 
I'm on my little all key, which is like a GoPro knockoff, uh, connected to a charger because the batteries are just getting hammered out here. But as you can see, the um, trail, not broken out at all, meaning I no longer have the help of somebody else's footprints or snow uh, shoe prints in front of me. So that adds a little bit of energy burn. Luckily, I just had a snack and I brought some snacks with me. So just keep plugging along. But that's what I've been doing. Haven't been able to film a whole lot. I've been just concentrating on having a trekking pole in each hand. I do like too, these guys are um, eight ounces a piece instead of 11 and a half, like my black diamonds and they actually fold down. But enough about that, I'll have to do a separate video on them. But yeah, as you can see, it's, it's interesting. But we're working through, but this is exactly why I have the poles to help me on these uphills. And then some of the steeper downhills, I'll put it on my downhill side to give me some peace of mind about rolling down. If I didn't have them, I'd be fine, but I would literally be going about a third of the speed my Adirondacks video from years ago, I did the same thing as this. I mean, I was in the Adirondacks, but I did kind of a left my camp behind and went up to a summit, decided not to bring poles, ended up regretting it, going really slow, actually fell on the way down. I didn't bank for the fact that on the way down, I would be going really slow, because that's where I really am gonna want to have these poles on the way down. I can put them in front of me and just give me some peace of mind and allow me to kind of step down one foot at a time and not worry about falling. And then once you do fall, you start worrying even more and you go even slower, right? So that's what I'm up to. <sighs> I think maybe mileage-wise I'm halfway, but I'm starting to get into the worst of the uphill, as you can see here. <sighs> Assuming this is the trail. <sighs> that snow is just relentless. It has been dumping the entire time. If I stand still at all, it just instantly builds up on me. Ah, I'm pretty sure my tarp is going to be pretty weighed down when I get back to camp. Just trying to go slow, not overwork. Shed some layers already, obviously. We'll just keep moving through here. Now, I hope, speaking of the Adirondacks video, I hope... I will feel real silly if it happens again, but in that video, I ran out of time. I hit my turnaround time before I got to the summit. I just didn't want to do too much crazy stuff, you know, like this in the dark. I hope that doesn't happen again. Whoa, that's deep. Jeez. Wow. Okay. Anyway. We'll see, it just depends on how much stuff like that I come across. All right, well, just to show you how much it is snowing, I stopped under these trees here, which are actually slowing the snowfall down a little bit, at least I hope they would, and to read my map. But take a look at this. <laughs> it's just dumping, and it's been doing this since I left, since it started back at camp. Look at that. Just in the time I'm talking, we've picked up that much. It's relentless. It's, it's out of control. Uh, but anyway, unfortunately, I'm also realizing, and I feel pretty, a little down about this, because I really thought that uh, this wouldn't happen again, but you can never plan. And I did have fun at camp this morning. It's not just about hitting summits, but we're, um, I don't think I'm anywhere near going to make it. Where am I here? Okay, we're coming up on the square ledge trail. We're not uh, doing anywhere near as good as I anticipated. 0.7 when we come to square ledge. Yeah, I don't know, we're close, but we're within a half hour of when I said I wanted to turn around, which was at two o'clock. That would give me two hours to get back down, and that would put me at four o'clock, because I still want to set up that different type of camp tonight, and cook, and be relaxed. I only have three and a half hours till sunset right now, and I've already spent close to, I guess we're going on two and a half hours coming up here. It's just really slow going. Um, the other thing is up top there, <laughs> clear that off, up top there on the summit, I already know from the forecast, they said that they anticipated for the summit forecast, uh, low visibility during the day if we got the snow that we're getting right now, and we are. 
So I already don't know what I'm going to see up there in the first place. And to see it during the dark <laughs> might be even less impressive. I don't know. Either way, I'm out here having fun. Um, and I want the whole experience to be a good time. So I'm just trying to get that balance. I mean, it does kind of bite to come up to the whites and not see off of a summit. But at the same time, I mean, look at the snow playground. This is why I drove nine hours. I, I can't get stuff like this. I mean, this is just incredible. So it's not a total loss. I'm not even chalking up as a loss yet. I don't know what's going to happen, but I have a feeling that soon I may have to make a decision, unfortunately. But wow, look at this snow. Ah, these things have been attacking me. These things have been attacking me all day. I've been keeping my hood up. So luckily they're not going down the back of my neck. But, silly me, I didn't bring a pack cover. Which isn't the end of the world in snow, but when it's coming down like this, God, it's all over my, uh, getting in my pockets on my pack and whatnot. But luckily it's so cold that nothing's melting. But, uh, anyway. At least this is a little bit smoother spot. It's all up to uphill, but at least this is smoother. Some of those sections are like obstacle courses. <sighs> now, this is when I get a little jealous, or I should say envious of times when I had <sighs> a hiking partner or two, and you could take turns with who's in front. That person breaks, which is the hardest job, and then the guy behind gets to walk in that, and the guy behind him it's the walk and even more pack down stuff and then you switch who's on point every once in a while but when you're by yourself nobody but you see that over there that would normally be a view I can barely make out some shapes but uh, yeah as of right now, it is completely gray. We're getting closer to the summit, but I highly doubt it's going to be any more visible than that over there, which, oh, sorry, got pelted in the face a little few too many times with snow, or specifically pelted in my eyes, so the goggles came out. Although, luckily, the wind is not too bad. I hear it a little bit up there, as you usually do when you approach these summits or above treeline areas, but it doesn't sound terrible. Usually, it sounds like a <laughs> like a monster is up there waiting for you. Right now I just noticed a slight increase, but other than that, it's been pretty still today. I'm not worried about wind. I'm not worried about cold. It's actually up to 22 degrees. So by all standards, it's pretty warm right now. But yeah, just no visibility. And this snow is just getting deep and deeper and deeper as I go. Now that's not just because the actual snowstorm going on, although that certainly is contributing. But it's mostly just because I'm get, venturing further into uh, untraveled territory. And it just hasn't been broken down a lot. So, thank goodness I brought the snowshoes with me. I wouldn't even have gotten this far, obviously. And if I didn't have the poles, like I said, I would be probably a mile behind. But, yeah, it's not looking great. Camp has sounded nice. Which is what I came here to do as well. But, I don't know. I just don't know. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I guess you know now what my decision was, huh? I did turn back, still using my little action cam here, because it is still incessantly snowing. And at this point, not only am I covered in it, but it's 337. So I did get here a little before 4, which was my latest target time. So I did the right thing. If the conditions were better, if I wasn't getting blasted by snow constantly and it looked like I could actually see something, maybe things would be different. But I got other things to do still, so it's all good, I believe. You can hear the nice sizzle of snow on the uh, Kuban fiber tarp over there, which, by the way, I got to take my hammock down, which feels really weird. But yeah, I'm going to take my hammock down, go into uh, Vivi mode somehow, maybe 
put this tarp down a little lower. I don't know when or if it's ever going to stop snowing. It's literally been snowing now for uh, almost six hours or so. Six hours plus and heavy. Don't even want to know what that parking lot with my Jeep sitting in it looks like, but we'll get to that tomorrow. Right now, I'm going to have dinner. I never did stop to eat that lunch, so I'm going to do that. Get myself rested up and um, then we'll reconvene. But it was just the right thing to do to come down there. I mean, I'm sure it would have worked out the other way, but I would have been night hiking for sure. I did end up turning around not too far after when I was making my little contemplation back there. And it, the crazy thing is, on the way back, it was within 20 minutes of me turning around, my footprints were already getting washed over. It's only been maybe 20 minutes since I went over these steps. I mean, I was just just turned around and they're already disappearing. Within half an hour of turning around, they were barely there. And not too long after that, they completely disappeared without a trace to the point where I started to wonder if I was actually on the right trail, the same one that I took up. But I was, it was just completely covered over. By the time I got here to camp, it looks completely different. I mean, I've walked around a little bit, but it's, uh, I gotta redo my bench and my cooking area is completely gone. But, uh, yeah, winter wonderland. So, right now I gotta get back on the melting snow. At some point, I have that meal that I have not tried yet that I'm looking forward to, the Pad Thai Asian type dish. Um, I really wanna just sit and actually properly enjoy it. It seems like at this point I'm gonna be hunched underneath of the uh, tarp to eat. So I may pick another one of my meals I've had before and save that one for either late night or <laughs> it might be for breakfast, which sounds weird, but it might be fun to have a nice, uh, you know, pad thai breakfast before heading out tomorrow. But anyway, I got chores to do and I want to brush the snow off, get under this tarp and maybe take a break because I've been getting pounded by snow all day. I don't even know what it sounds like to not have it hitting the roof of my hood here. Although I'm sure it's actually louder underneath of the tarp over here. Good. Got this little camera working. Hopefully it stays working. Listen guys, here's what's going on. Um, <laughs> I may have to make a second judgment call here. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just been dumping non-stop. Now, that's fine. I knew it was going to snow. And, um, yeah, that's fine. But the problem is, right now, got back to camp. But my dilemma here is all of my camera gear is pretty much frozen. All of my gear actually is pretty much frozen from thawing and freezing and thawing and refreezing. Okay, it's not the best shot in the world, but it's gonna happen. Anyway, yeah, so as an example, this is my camera bag. It's not waterproof. For snow, it's usually fine, but it's thawed and refrozen several times, hoping all my gear isn't damaged. That's fine. I mean, it wouldn't be fine if it's damaged, but I can I can figure things out. I've been through that before. My problem is, on top of that, I haven't had dinner yet. I did eat some ramen noodles real quick. With what water I had, I was able to get the diesel going again. Um, but I still have to melt more snow which seems like it's gonna be a chore enough out there. It's obviously pitch black, as you can tell, hopefully you can see me. I'm just wondering if it's smart for me right now. I'm wondering if it's smart for me to restage all my stuff and set up an entirely new camp when what I really should be doing is melting snow, drinking water to hydrate, eating food, staying warm. Uh, right now, I would have to take all my stuff and put it somewhere I don't even know where it will be when I sleep. I mean, I could tuck it in here with me. I don't know. I've never been demoralized by snow before, but I think this is perhaps a first. Um, it's quite different when it comes down so hard, so fast, and so constant. It's not even like snow. It's really like almost mini hail. They're not even flakes. They're just little shards of ice that have been coming down for hours. Um, I just want to be safe and warm tonight. I know I could pull it off, and I know I could be safe safe and somewhat safe about it. 
but I won't even really be able to document it or share it with you. I just don't know how much sense it all makes. So here's the deal. I'll come back out sometime and I'll do a bivy hike. And maybe I'll just come out and do specifically this bag with the bivy and no setting up two different camps or maybe no blizzard. Or maybe just, if I didn't have both, <laughs> then I'd probably be okay. But it's starting to not make sense. And I've been going back and forth about it. And I don't want to not come through on something I said I would do for this video. But I think it's the right thing for me to do is to just take my piece of Tyvek that I was using for um, a ground cloth yesterday, wrap all my gear tightly with it. Usually I put my camera bag in my backpack overnight to keep it safe. I can't do that now because this thing's covered in ice and I got other stuff in there that's important in my main pack. Anyway, I'm going to bundle everything up in Tyvek. I'm going to focus on melting snow, which you've already seen me do, no biggie. I'm going to keep myself hydrated, I'm going to eat some dinner, and I'm going to get in this here bag. Another thing I am going to make sure to do is to work on the end of it to make sure it's nice and sealed up. Um, I'll probably, I don't want to worry about the proper way to do it right now. I'm just going to take the same line that I used for my bear bag line over there, and I'm just going to tie some of those loops together to make sure that, that zipper will not come open. And then I'll have to just sleep properly with my head outside of this thing tonight so I can trap on my body inside. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. It seems like the right thing to do. I'm a little bummed that I didn't follow through on my um, one night in the hammock, one night on the ground, but we'll come back out and do something. But right now I gotta focus on snow and melting. All that good stuff. Alright, that's what I'm gonna do. And is the camera still on? Still blinking. We made it. Woo! All right. Let's regroup tomorrow. As you can see, it has stopped snowing. Finally actually stopped right when I finally got in bed last night. Ironically, of course, right? Yeah, that was like 9.30. So that was a good 12 hours of really heavy, granular, almost icy snow. Um, it was crazy. Uh, it's definitely the most snow I've ever hiked in. It's one of the bigger storms I've I was thinking it's one of the bigger bigger storms I've ever really paid attention to. I mean, I'm sure I've been through bigger storms, but usually you're, you're in your house watching the news talk about road closures. And I was out here trying to go up to a summit and um, set up multiple camps, which obviously I didn't do. But I'm glad I did that, you know, because honestly, the short and the long of it is I didn't really have any reason to create some hectic scenario yesterday i.e. sleeping on the ground all of a sudden because I was already in a actual hectic scenario so we can come back and do that some other time like I said last night but anyway right now I'm feeling good it's around 7 in the morning sun is out it's been so dark at night um, the moonrise I think is coming up later in the middle of the night plus it's been it was clear that first night I can't really see too much through these trees here but I could still see a ton of stars it was amazing last night of course the visibility because of the storm couldn't see much but it was still so dark um, but anyway so I got the same setup as yesterday there with the uh, good old hammock and I had better luck with the uh, sleep system last night now that I, I'm getting a little more used to it I did tie up the other end I uh, just actually tied the zippers together and then tied a couple of the pools together with some rope and that worked pretty well and I slept with my head actually um, exposed and the drawstring cinched around me like you would in an actual mummy bag on the ground. And that kept all the heat in there with me much better than the first night. And then over behind me, of course there's my snowshoes buried in the snow. I got my cook set already. I uh, cooked my dinner with that and melted snow. I kept it outside of the tarp, but right there. And then I have my pad back there so that I could stay sheltered from the snow and just kind of reach out when I needed to to melt the snow. The diesel worked fine, but I wanted to keep it away. I didn't want it too close to the tarp because A, I didn't want to flare up to melt my Kuban. That actually I thought would be less likely because my Kuban's up pretty high, but I didn't want those diesel fumes, which are a little smoky and smelly when it's first getting started up to get all over my gear. So I wanted it further away. 
anyway, so we'll swap that out. If the canister doesn't work, then we'll go back to diesel. But you see, I got my little couch over here. I've had to dig that out multiple times over the course of this trip. But that's my little Z-Lite pad dug in there. Uh, I got my mittens out and my military surplus uh, gloves here, wool gloves. And then there's EMS hard shells over top. So for the most part, I keep those on over top of this unless I need dexterity. Because um, obviously you don't have much dexterity with mittens. I made, I don't know if it was a mistake. I mean, it was the last night I was here, so I made the decision. These were really wet just from condensation, perspiration, and constant sleet and snow and um, and just back and forth temperatures, freezing and freezing and rethawing. Sorry, my tongue's frozen right now too. So they are frozen solid, and that's something to keep in mind. Once you take something off, it's gonna freeze. And if it's synthetic, you're probably better off leaving it on and letting it dry out naturally. But in my case, I had a backup, so I decided to switch over. Um, the downside is those have more dexterity and they're waterproof. These ones are my waterproof option now. And another thing on the subject of once you take a layer off, just be prepared, you might not go back to it. Last night, when I was going through my layers, I had my down jacket off while I was hiking. Thankfully, I was smart enough to do that plus I didn't need it I was heating up a lot going up those hills um, but the down is not good to get wet unlike my synthetics which will keep working if they're wet so I kept the military fleece on that whole day while I was hiking when I got back to camp my plan was to put the down jacket back on when I opened up my jacket I instantly started getting all this frost forming on me all over my fleece and on the inside of my jacket and that's because I was actually I couldn't tell because I was wearing all synthetics that were slowly they're breathable even this hard shell it does wick out through it as you can see some of it on my sleeve right there anyway I didn't realize it but I was a lot wetter than I thought and I was like man do I put this on over top of my down and do I also even if I do that, do I go to bed with it or do I take it off now? But if I had taken it off now, I guarantee you this thing was way wetter than I thought. And um, it, it would have been a frozen plank like my gloves over there if I had taken it off. So what I did was I put it on over top of my down, hoping that I would generate heat underneath. And then usually synthetics will wick outward. So sure enough, my down never got messed up. I stayed warm the whole night. I even got in the hammock and the um, Outdoor Vitals mummy pod got in there. And even though I'm sure it was damp, I never felt damp and I woke up this morning and I'm nice and dry. Everything breathed out. So I'm happy about that. That's another reason I made sure to sleep properly with my head in the right position last night in that mummy pod so that I wasn't creating any more condensation in there than necessary. And I could kind of breathe out all the condensation from my body and my wet clothes. And I got through it. Oh, two other quick tips for extreme cold weather and clothing that I want to give you real quick. Speaking of my hard shell jacket, obviously I didn't sleep in that. I took it off and I left it underneath of my hammock um, covering my boots actually. It was frozen solid in the morning. Stiff as a board, right? Take advantage of that. I picked it up and I checked the inside and sure enough there was still uh, condensation in there from all my activity the previous day. Before you start messing with that jacket, definitely before you put it on, I know you're going to want to because you're cold, take that thing, shake it, rub it together, shake it, rub it together, repeat. You're going to start noticing basically a bunch of ice crystals form and it's going to look like your jacket is snowing. That's good. You want to do that before you start messing with the jacket too much because once it starts thawing, then it's just going to go back to being liquid and unless you have like some towels or something. Trust me, you want to do it while it's frozen. Just crinkle it together vigorously. Not only is this going to get all the condensation out of there, at least some of it, I should say, it's also going to be a nice morning activity to get you warmed up because believe me, I've spent a lot of time in the morning, both days, just wearing a path back and forth in here, walking back and forth for no reason just to get the blood flowing. Another quick tip, your boots. Um, I did not do this last night, but I wish I did take them at night well when you take them off to get in your tent hammock whatever when you take them off make sure to open them nice and wide and get those laces undone before you go to bed because i didn't do that in this morning they were frozen solid and it took me quite some time and i felt like i was going to break an ankle trying to get back into them and unlacing them to make it easier to get in was near impossible because they were frozen solid. So just a couple quick tips to make your life possibly a little easier when you're out here in these 
lovely but frigid conditions. But anyway, right now I'm gonna have breakfast, do some camp chores, pack up, and then we'll get on the trail and head back to the Jeep and see if I'm um, snowed in. The lot I went to looks like it gets plowed every once in a while. There's either gonna be a ton of snow or worst case scenario, I'm plowed in, but hey, I got the shovel you see me using the whole time. Plus I have another shovel I keep in the Jeep all the time, so we'll get through it. If we gotta put the uh, lockers on to get out of here, then we'll do that. Hopefully, don't wanna get overconfident, but I think we'll get out of here. So, before all that though, I'm gonna have breakfast. I've been trying to eat this meal the whole time. I'm finally gonna do it. I got my Alpine Air brand Thai style chicken. Mildly spiced Thai sauce and noodles, chicken and vegetables. Seems kind of weird for breakfast, but I have a feeling it's gonna be hot and amazing. Uh, there's nothing like hot food in a cold, snowy woods. And I also have my little Packet Gourmet. That's another brand of food that I enjoy. Um, Packet Gourmet bag for reheating. It has like reflective material on the inside there. I find that helps heat up meals all the time, but particularly in the winter, um, it'll help things heat up more thoroughly. And then also if you get caught up in camp chores, which is often the case in winter, it'll give you a little more time, actually a lot more time in my experience, before your food starts to get cold. I left my dinner the first night sitting in there for 45 minutes and my meal was piping hot when I went to eat it. So that is a good little thing to have. You can make your own out of Reflectix as well, but I think that was like six bucks. All right, enough of my blabbing. Let's see if I can get this stove lit and eat some Thai noodles. I did have this with me last night and it's still definitely liquid. It might even still be at least room temperature, slightly warm, uh, 40 below water bottle. I've shown that before. Filled it with um, almost boiling water last night when I was melting snow right before bed. Put it in a plastic bag just for extra safety, but I've never had it leak on me. But anyway, that's what I put next to this to try to heat it back up in the sleeping bag this morning. Take the little safety tab off. By the way, I used to think when I bought these things, this was just like packaging material and I would toss this, but don't do that. It keeps your threads on the can protected and safe and keeps dirt and stuff or snow out of there. So keep these things. I'll put that in my little stuff sack to the side here. Keep your fingers clear because sometimes I've put that on too slow and you get a burst coming out and in cold conditions that can really hurt. This will be a lot easier than messing with diesel. Woo! I waited a little bit so that's why I had that fireball. But if you're quicker that normally won't happen. Might be burning off some re residual gunk from the uh, diesel because usually ISO Pro type blends burn cleaner than this. But I think it's just because the stuff I have in there and it might need to heat up once it does it should start burning blue and I'll flip it over in fact I think it's starting to give up already I'm just going to try to flip it and there we go come on now it's in liquid mode it should be getting a nice mix of both all right another tip too I don't have a can of, uh, container to put it in but if you don't have an inverted system like this for an upright system, you could take a small container of water and submerge your can in that. It might seem kind of weird at first, but when you think about it, if water is in its liquid state, that means it's at least above 32 degrees, which is warmer than the air temp. Therefore, your gas will be more willing to vaporize and come out of that can. Okay, let's get the pot. I did find myself last night having to be careful when, oh shoot, oh no, I gave up. It's too cold. That's exactly what happened yesterday. All right, well, I've still got well over half a container of diesel fuel left in this uh, 450 mil. So diesel's about to save the day again. Now, before this trip, I only had an old school MSR rapid fire stove that did just this. It only did canisters, either upright or inverted. And that's what I was gonna bring until Optimus sent me this stove for evaluation. Um, I, I would be pretty upset right now. I mean, sitting out, it's still going to start to catch that ambient air temperature and cool down, which is what just happened. Darn. All right, well, I'm glad I got this new stove. That's for sure. Ah, one last resort I want to try. I just thought of. Now, very well might just be because of the cold temps, but I have been burning diesel in there all of yesterday, basically. As I've said numerous times, that stuff's dirty. 
on my old stove like i was talking about the rapid fire i had to carry this little tool with a needle on it it would clean the jet if it got dirty but on this model there's actually a needle built into the bottom of it and i can just wave this magnet underneath a few times and that's working the needle back and forth right now or in a pinch i've also read guys say you can just shake it and as you can see there's a bunch of crap coming out of there probably coming out of the wick too but I'm going to try that. Maybe the fuel nozzle is gunked up. Nope. All right. That wasn't it. Okay. Never mind. Back to diesel. And then we'll get some Thai style chicken in my future. Hopefully. Oh yeah, that's a boil right there. Thank you, Dirty Diesel. Give this a quick stir. And they say let sit eight to 10 minutes or something like that, I'm not sure. I'm gonna let it sit longer. I find with these meals, it usually doesn't hurt. And that way I can start breaking down my tent site, or pardon me, my hammock site. The tarp lines are proving to be, I just did the first one. There, it's, you know, I did those dead, uh, dead man anchors by just taking a couple sticks, putting a loop on my guy line for the tarp through it. So the loop was on the stick and they were buried in the snow. That's usually hard enough to get out, but then I got all this fresh snow on top. So anyway, my point is I got a lot of work to do to get those out of the ground without destroying my tarp lines. And then I'll break down the hammock, put all that away, or at least get a good head start while this is percolating. I'll probably have a cup of coffee in the meantime too. Just kind of keep an eye on this. Give it a pump every once in a while. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Chores and waiting for my Thai noodles to rehydrate. Uh, I should probably have my gaiters on. I made it this far and I'm finally gonna get snow in my boots, but maybe if I just work my way to it. I won't go too deep in the snow and mess myself up on the last day. Oh, good Lord. All right, now we're down to the hard stuff. So that was all fresh stuff right there. Now that's not to say it actually snowed that much, but that's all the snow that was running off of my tarp throughout the day. Because I know for a fact, there wasn't any powder like that on top of this line when I buried it. Whew, it is hard back now. Like I said, I'm trying, oh, I'm trying not to destroy my line. But we'll get there. Oh, that one came out easier than the first one. Nice. All right, so just do that a few more times. Then I can eat. All right. Lines are taken care of. Whew. Time to have some breakfast. I almost said lunch, but it's breakfast. Uh, I have worked up quite an appetite and I've warmed up a lot by doing these chores, which is nice. Everything just takes so much longer in the winter, but I mean, that's really part of it is just kind of being, it, being out here and building your own little world and then taking it back down especially in the winter, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. And then when you leave, there really is no trace after a couple snowstorms or a little melt. And uh, yet you can build a whole couch, which I'm not too good at woodwork. So uh, I only really get to do stuff like this in the winter. I also um, really, I'll tell you what, this, this Z-Lite pad is probably the most effective $40 I've ever spent in terms of backpacking and camping. I originally bought it just because I was being cheap for my first backpacking trip and I didn't want to spend $100 on a Thermarest inflatable pad. But this thing is great and it's awesome for just, like I said earlier in the video, just sitting and hanging around. Another thing that it's kind of cool for, now last night I put it underneath of my um, hammock so I had somewhere dry to stand on when I didn't have my boots on for getting in and out of the hammock. 
Now I'm not saying I did this, but theoretically it is possible that you could have this folded up into just a big enough square for you to stand on, like I said, or get out of your hammock. And um, theoretically now, you could actually unfold it to its full length so it actually went away from the hammock and uh, one could kind of follow that like a red carpet right to, uh, let's call it nature's call, all without having to put your boots on in the middle of the night. Not bad. Now I understand it's not actually red, so it wouldn't be a red carpet, but after explaining all that, I just thought it would be in poor taste to call it a yellow carpet. Yeah. Anyway, on that appetizing note, here we go. Thai style chicken and noodles. Okay, so it's like an elbow kind of shaped noodle. Fluff it up here. Mmm, smells good. Got some nice spices. Very noodly. After trudging around the snow and whatnot, it's going to be some well needed calories, I think, to get me back to the car. In which case, I will be scouting for somewhere to get a cheeseburger. Since I am off keto now, that means I get a nice burger with bun. And here I go again. Every time I have a meal in these videos, I'm talking about the next meal. Let's try this. Mmm. Okay. Noodles are nice and done. They're very small noodles. So at first I was afraid maybe they hadn't actually like cooked and expanded, but they're just very tiny noodles. So that gives it a cool texture. Mmm. It's also probably why it makes it effective that it gets done in only eight to 10 minutes. This is good. Now they um, say mildly spicy and they're right. I like really spicy food. So for me, I would add, you know, like some sort of little packet of hot sauce or something to this if I was in the mood for spicy. Right now it's hitting the spot. Mm. Chicken in there. Well, I am getting some protein, 28 grams. This is the first, I think this is the first dinner I've had by Alpine Air. Like I said, I like packet gourmet and I do like Mountain House. They catch some crap sometimes, but there's some ones that just for nostalgia reasons I've been eating for years. Because when I first started backpacking, I uh, always bought, bought Mountain House. They were just available everywhere. But started noticing these guys. I think it was Zeke on our Pemi Loop trip um, showed me this for the first time. I forget what dish he had by them. And I was like, oh, I never heard of that. Mm -mm -mm. Good stuff. I had a little bit of coffee um, while I was doing my shoveling over there. One tip I will point out. Now, I've been using diesel fuel. Um, on this trip. It really wasn't my intention to use it as much as I am, but I did bring it as kind of a worst case scenario, but I don't want people to get the wrong impression that I'm, because I'm using it so much on this video, that I'm advocating it as a go-to fuel. I would say the canister fuel or white gas for cold conditions is the ideal way to go. But that being said, I like to try worst case scenario out. And I'm sure plenty of people say diesel's terrible. Why would you ever use that? But I don't know. Go out there and find out why. Maybe you'll learn something from it. Maybe it won't be as bad as you think. Or, in this case, I'm using the worst case scenario fuel. I'll appreciate that much more when I do have um, an ideal fuel on my next trip. But it's been working fine. Now, that being said, when I made that coffee, that's what made me think of this. I um, was melting snow, of course, and I had my coffee cup sitting over there. And I went to pour it in and I accidentally tapped the bottom of the pot right on my coffee cup. I got a bunch of soot on the rim, luckily on just one half of it, from the diesel fuel. Now I got a little bit of soot from the white gas too, but not nearly as much as the diesel. Luckily I have some paper towels so I was able to wipe it off carefully and just drink from the opposite side of the cup. But you do want to keep that in mind, especially for snow melt, wherever I put that pot down. I get the soot on the snow. So you wanna make sure you have kind of a designated place to sit your pot down continually. Another thing too that I noticed, if you're the type of person who likes to cook in the same vessel that you drink out of, now in my case, I have a separate coffee cup for this trip, but I did notice when I had those ramen noodles the other night after using diesel fuel, um, I like to drink the broth at the end. And I uh, noticed a little bit of an oily texture on my lips and it was because I had gotten some soot that had ridden up the side of the pan. So if you're the type that likes to drink out of the same vessel you cook with, uh, yeah, diesel or even white gas, you might want to watch out for. That being said, if you are patient with the diesel, just make sure that you keep it a nice controlled flame because the diesel flame from what I've seen will get way bigger 
than the white gas flame. So there's a lot more ability to crank it up and it starts, the flame starts riding the side of the pot and that's how you get all that soot on the side. If you keep it low, then you'll keep that soot just on the bottom, which even if you're not drinking out of your pot, you gotta think when you're pouring out of the pot into your water container, if you've got the flames riding so high that you got soot all the way up to the lip, then it's potentially pouring the water across that lip and you might be getting a little bit of soot in your water. Thankfully that hasn't happened to me, but just something to look out for. All right, well, enough about that. If you can't tell, I'm having a lot of fun nerding out uh, testing this stove on this trip. But I'm going to get back to eating. And then from here on out, it's just um, pack it up. And then we'll hit the trail. It's only a couple miles out of here. And then I can move on to seeing if I can actually, you know, drive out of the parking lot or not. But one battle at a time. We are officially on our way and you can see there is no trace of my tracks even from getting here last night or yesterday afternoon around what was that 3.30. It kept snowing until 9.30 so it kept snowing another six hours after I got back to camp. That's crazy and heavy. I, I, it was pretty much the same heavy snow the whole time except for maybe the last I would say two to three hours you did notice a little taper down and then the last hour it was like oh i think it's going to stop soon and then it finally did but for the most part it was just that same consistent heaviness all day that left us with this lovely snow fresh powder here i'll carefully make my way through i don't have my hiking poles today because as soon as i get to the trail i think i should be okay it's not a lot of super uphill i just gotta make sure not to fall on my butt on this little section here getting from camp to the trail I do, as usual, have GPS data for this trip, as I try not to trip. That's on my website. There's also a link in the video description. And for my notable gear as well, and a list of the stuff I use. So for those of you who would like to support the channel, using the Amazon link on my website or in the video description is a great way to do that. Just a little shameless plug, but that does make these trips possible, and it's much appreciated. But. Enough of the shameless promo. Let's try to safely get back to the trail and towards the flame broiled goodness. It's a little after lunchtime now for sure. Hung out at camp till around yeah, early afternoon now. And we'll start slowly making our way back. Just a couple miles. <laughs> Actually, you know it's really funny. As I'm saying that, but oh let's get back to the trail. I'm like, I feel like I've gone far enough, but this is the trail. I wouldn't, I almost walked straight into the woods. Obviously it was a little too dense for that, or else I may have. It does not look the same at all. Now, back down here is the trailhead and the Jeep. I do want to go over here just a little bit. I want to see that sign that we first saw on day one. I want to see where the snow depth is on that sign compared to day one, just for fun. Let's make our way over there. Wow, that's quite different. Now, of course, some of that is a little bit of drifting. There's drifts everywhere, really. It's just a sea of drifts. But as you can see, compared to the first day, yeah, that is quite different. Definitely up to the bottom of it, legitimately. And then with the drift, Almost up to the top, can't even read it anymore. Well, that was a fun little excursion. Didn't cost me too much time. That was worth it, that's crazy. All right, let's turn around and get ourselves back to this vehicle. Man, I'm wondering, really wondering what it's gonna look like in that parking lot. If I'm plowed in, if I'm snowed in, what's it gonna be? Oh man, there she is, 
still there. And we don't look terribly plowed in either, which is pretty awesome. So I'm feeling pretty good. <sighs> it's about an hour and a half or two maybe later, which I know seems crazy. It's only two miles of a trek in the summer. You knock that out in no time, right? But it was tough going. It was some real slogging along, just, just grinding. I mean, even on the flat sections of trail, it was just deep, fresh powder, unbroken. And uh, I was doing a pretty decent pace, but I knew I didn't have too far to go. But I eventually got here. I'm feeling good. I'm super hungry. And I'm ready to go. Oh, and by the way, remember before when I said I've never found myself needing the float extenders on my uh, snowshoes? Well, uh, I probably could have used them on this trip, but live and learn. Anyway, until next time, I'm Syntax77, and right now it is definitely cheeseburger time. <laughs>